Hello and welcome uh, again and good evening. My name is Amy. I'm the Public Programs Manager at the museum. If you haven't been to the museum, it's really a great place to visit. We are located in downtown Brooklyn in a decommissioned IND subway station. We're open Thursday to Sunday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., and you can reserve your tickets on our website. We also have a satellite gallery and a shop in Grand Central Terminal, which is worth a visit too. For today's programs, if you'd like captions, you can go to captions at the bottom of the screen uh, and click captions or the three dots and then click show captions. Also, we will leave time for questions at the end. Feel free to add them to the chat during the presentation and I will share them out at the end to Mary and Nellie. So now I'm pleased to introduce our presenters for today, Mary Hedge and Nellie Hankins. Mary Hedge is the manager of MTA Bridges and Tunnels Special Archive. She has held this position since 2009 and has served in similar, posi similar positions at the YMCA of Greater New York and American Express Company. She is a graduate of New York University's Archival Management and Historical Editing Program. Nellie Hinkins is an Assistant Project Manager at the MTA Bridges and Tunnels Special Archive, where she has worked since 2015. She has a background in public library work and holds a degree in library and information science from the University of Pittsburgh. So now I'll hand it over to Mary and Nellie. Thank you very much, Amy. <laughs> We are so pleased that you are joining us this evening for our special anniversary of Bridges and Tunnels, the 90th anniversary. We're going to be talking a little bit about who we are and what we do. We're going to also focus a little bit on the holdings of our special archive and how we use them. I'm Mary. And I'm Nellie. What is MTA Bridges and Tunnels? We were formerly the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority and many of you would know that name. We were chaired by Robert Moses from 1936 to 1968, and we've been a division of the MTA since 1968. And we're showing you a photo here of Robert Moses in one of his less serious moments, feeding a yama at the New York World's Fair in 1964. And if you don't know Robert Moses, um, he was popularly known as the master builder of New York. So he held many, many titles. Uh, none of them were democratically elected, but he uh, had a huge influence on the infrastructure of New York and really wielded a lot of power in New York State and New York City uh, throughout the 20th century. Yeah. Um, here is a second and very interesting photo of Robert Moses. This was taken in 1968 when he was forced to give up the chairmanship of the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority. And here is his successor, the first chairman of the MTA William Ronan. So this is a very unusual photo. We're just showing this to you for reference. Um, so as Amy mentioned, we're celebrating our 90th anniversary this year. Uh, we're very excited about that. Uh, when we say 90th anniversary, we're referring to the 90th anniversary of the agency that you see in the upper left-hand corner, the Triborough Bridge Authority. But actually we're made up of many smaller predecessor agencies. Uh, you can see them outlined on the uh, graphic here. Robert Moses chaired all of these at different points in time, including briefly the New York City Tunnel Authority. But by 1946, they had all consolidated into one agency, the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority. So if you hear us refer to any of these smaller agencies, just know that we're referring to a predecessor agency. Throughout the presentation, we'll refer to the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority generally, or MTA Bridges and Tunnels, um, which are the same thing as Mary mentioned. What does MTA Bridges and Tunnels do? We collect tolls and we fund other MTA agencies. We maintain and operate seven bridges and two tunnels, and they include the Robert F. Kennedy Bridge, formerly known as the Triborough Bridge, the Henry Hudson Bridge, the Marine Parkway Gil Hodges Memorial Bridge, the Bronx Whitestone Bridge, the Queens Midtown Tunnel, the Hugh L. Carey Tunnel, which was formerly known as the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, the Throgsneck Bridge, the Verrazano Bridge, and the Cross Bay Veterans Cross, Memorial Cross Bay Bridge. Veterans Memorial Bridge, sorry. So as you can see on this map, 
uh, we really have a presence in all five boroughs. So this map, the darker uh, shapes indicate the land, the lighter shapes indicate the water, and the purple circles indicate our facilities. So you can really see our presence in all five boroughs of the city. And the lines, the blue lines, indicate highway systems. So in addition to seeing our facilities and their presence in the city, you can really see what an important role we play in navigating the entire New York region. And that was by design. So as our facilities were being put together and designed and planned, they were designed in conjunction with these roads here uh, to really make New York part of a broader highway network. And our construction was really done in two pushes that coincided with two major sources of federal funding. So the first one was the Great Depression and the New Deal era. The second one was the passage of the Federal Highway Act. Um, and interstate highway funding. Uh, our facilities were not built with interstate highway funding because they are told, but the approaches, these highways that you see, they were. So we have this map, which is from 1949, which is an interesting document. Um, you can see the highway network here. So even in 1949, our facilities were being um, planned as part of a broader highway network. So the, in this map, the um, orange arrows indicate the facilities. You can see at this point, several of our, of our facilities um, are not yet mapped, but after the Great Depression, um, this was our presence in the city. Uh, this was our first depression era bridge, and uh, it was actually planned by uh, the New York City Department of Plant and Structures. And this is one of their drawings from uh, 1916 or so. And you can see here the three bridges that were planned to reach the three boroughs of Manhattan, the Bronx and Queens. The first, the top bridge is a suspension bridge. That's the main one that goes from Astoria to Randall's Island. The middle one is the Manhattan span of the Triborough Bridge from Manhattan to Randall's Island. And the bottom one goes over the Bronx Kills, and that's the smallest of the three. So uh, the, um, this bridge, ground was broken for the bridge in 1929, and, the, and New York City built some anchorages, acquired property, um, but had to give it up because of the stock market crash, crash and the drying up of funds. So the Tribal Bridge Authority was created in 1933 to pick up where the city had left off. So on the left here, you can see um, the uh, tower, one of the two towers of the bridge. And you'll notice that the uh, tower has a lot of crosses in it, X's in it, and they are trusts crosses that stabilize the bridge and make it stronger. And you'll see some, of, some examples of the different bridges uh, that we include um, and, uh, and the different types. On the uh, 11th of July, 1936, the bridge opened and you can see a full up parking lot of people dressed in their summer clothes to celebrate the opening of the bridge. Uh, in 1936, um, we also opened the Henry Hudson Bridge, which was part of the Henry Hudson Parkway. So here you can see um, the construction of the bridge. This bridge was actually built in two phases. So here you can see um, one phase of construction. Uh, the plan was that this bridge would be able to be built with a second deck on top so that when traffic numbers supported the construction, they could uh, increase capacity. And that actually happened uh, just two years later. So this image is from the opening of the second upper deck of the Henry Hudson Bridge. And here it is today. This is one of our uh, more interesting bridges, at least to me. Um, it is the Marine Parkway Bridge and it opened in 1937. So this is our third bridge from the Depression era. And you can see here that the center bridge is in place and a side span is being floated into place to meet up with it. It's a lift span bridge, meaning that the center section elevates just like an elevator to allow marine traffic to go through. This is a, a really beautiful shot of the bridge and it once completed, and you can see it's very unusual towers and it's very unusual truss work. Uh, the towers kind of curve into each other in a playful way. And uh, on a beautiful sky blue day and blue ocean, um, it looks very attractive. You can actually uh, walk over the bridge or ride your bike over the bridge from Flatbush Avenue to Reese Park. And it's actually a very nice thing to do in the summer. 
And we've been talking a lot about how um, our structures connect places, but this structure actually connected people with a specific event. So this is the Bronx Whitestone Bridge. It opened in 1939. It was the last of our Great Depression bridges. Um, and it was planned in conjunction with the World's Fair, the 1939-1940 World's Fair, to connect people um, driving from the mainland to Queens. So here it is under construction in January of 1939. And here's Robert Moses speaking at the opening. Um, I love this color image. Yeah. It's very rare from the 30s. Yeah. Um, and this is the bridge today. Do you want to say anything, Nelly, about how that bridge and the towers compare to the Triborough Bridge? There, there's no truss work in those Right. Towers. So interestingly, the Triborough Bridge was redesigned. Um, so originally, in the design that Mary showed, it had a lot of granite facing. This bridge, uh, there was no redesign. And also it was an extension of architectural design. So at this point, there was an idea that bridges could be um, built as these very long spare um, architectural features. And also that the longer they were, the steadier they would hold themselves. That actual principle turned out to be false. Yeah. Um, but you can see it in the design here. Uh, you can see that at this point, this minimalism had really taken hold of bridge design, um, and we'll see it in at least two more of our structures. Yeah. And then we have the Queens Midtown Tunnel. So we've been talking about bridges, um, but the construction of tunnels during the Great Depression era was also um, something that really played a role in our history. So the Queens Midtown Tunnel connects Queens and Midtown Manhattan. You can hear that in the name. Um, and it's the only facility that Robert Moses had no hand in designing or building. So the New York City Tunnel Authority that we saw in that previous uh, graphic was um, founded in 1936. They constructed this tunnel. It was built, uh, opened in 1940. Here you can see the rock face with the holes drilled in for the dynamite and the chalk outline of the tunnel. Uh, and it was constructed by compressed air workers known as sand hogs. So compressed air work was incredibly dangerous, but during the Great Depression, it was considered um, good work. And in fact, all of our facilities, I think it's worth noting, really, in addition to um, connecting the region and providing for the cheap and easy flow of goods and services, they were also real job centers. So the Triborough Bridge, for example, um, had 5,000 workers a day on site. Similarly, the Queens Midtown Tunnel was a real driver for employment. Um, these men are sitting in what's known as a decompression chamber. So they would sit in this decompression chamber, they'd go down, they'd work in the compressed air for 90 minutes. And there was a real concern about the bends. So uh, if you work under compressed air or if you're a scuba diver, nitrogen can dissolve in your blood. Uh, and create these incredibly painful bubbles in your blood. So by the 30s, when they were constructing this tunnel, they knew it was a danger, they knew how to fix it. And they would make people sit in these decompression chambers for hours going down, working, and then coming back out. Uh, so you really had to like the people that you were on the job with. Um, and here's a tour. LaGuardia is in the center. Um, we think Ole Singstad is on the left. Uh, he was the man that designed the tunnel. Uh, and oil skins, and they're um, touring the tunnel for holing through. And another famous visitor was President Roosevelt. Um, so he was attending the groundbreaking, but then in this photo, he actually became the first person to drive through the tunnel two weeks before it was officially completed on his way to the groundbreaking for our other tunnel. The Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. Uh, so this was the fifth structure that was built in the Depression era and before, before World War II. And uh, you can see that um, the work is um, both mucky, dirty, and it was very, very noisy as well. So what these workers are doing is excavating the rock below the, below the surface and taking out the excavated material, the rubble. And you can see tracks that, le that are leading through the photo and uh, that would carry the muck car out to the construction shaft and then it would be elevated up to the surface. So that was a major phase of construction. This was a very celebratory moment. This was the moment when they were, when they hold through, meaning they met in the middle under the waters between Brooklyn and Manhattan. And uh, they celebrated that. And that was the success of the tunnel. Uh, the, the, what they did after that was actually, actually line the tunnel with steel and iron. 
And this is, you could call this the front of the tunnel, but you might also call it the back of the tunnel. And you'll see why when Nelly shows a slide later. So this is the, uh, the entrance and the exit to the tunnel. Um, you can see behind it, it's in Lower Manhattan, you can see behind it um, uh, Battery Park. And if you squint, you can see in the distance the towers of the Verrazano Bridge. So I like this one because it shows two facilities at the same time. This is uh, a post-war bridge. So this bridge uh, linked up with several parkways and highways as part of the interstate system. This is an early photo that shows the construction of uh, one of the Throgs Neck Bridges towers. The Throgs Neck runs from uh, the Bronx to Queens. And it's very similar to uh, the other suspension bridges, the Bronx Whitestone. And um, they're in a very early phase of construction, as I said. There's a temporary platform for the men to work on the next phase, which is running the cables over the towers. Here you can see an aerial view of the Throgs Neck Bridge. And you can see that the um, the bridge itself between the towers and the anchorage is relatively short. The greater distance is the approach roads that kind of make an S shape from uh, the Bronx to Queens. And we're looking uh, in, in, the, in the lower part of the photo at the, at the Bronx section and the uh, Throgs Neck Peninsula. And here is a beautiful sun, sunrise shot of the finished bridge. And it looks very similar to the Bronx Whitestone Bridge. It has, it has no truss work. Its towers are very minimalist. Uh, and the last of our facilities that we built, I'm going to say from scratch, uh, was the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. Um, you guys have all probably seen it. Maybe you've driven over it. Um, in this image, they're lifting the road work into place, the road trusses. Um, it's the same thing as what is happening in this photo, just from a different angle. And like the Henry Hudson Bridge, uh, this bridge was also built with two decks. Like the Henry Hudson Bridge, when it opened, only one of those decks was um, functional. And so the idea was that uh, projections set in 10 years, traffic would support the opening of the lower level. Uh, it happened much sooner than that in just four or five years. Um, this is the opening day motorcade on the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. You can see it's the upper level, um, but the lower level below it is also uh, extant, even in this photo. Uh, and here is the bridge today. So this is both our last bridge and our first bridge. The bridge on the right is an old bridge that dates back to 1925. It was built by the city and taken over by the Tribal Bridge Authority in 1939. And you can see towards the upper left of the photo, there's a darker section. And that shows that the bridge was a bascule bridge, meaning it opened up almost like a seesaw. So um, by the 1960s, it was opening so frequently and creating traffic jams and complaints. So uh, the authority decided to build a separate bridge and they kept the old bridge open while they built the new one and then demolished it once the new bridge was open. And it's, um, it's really a, a viaduct more than a bridge. It's not a suspension bridge, it's not an arch bridge, but on a sunny day with a blue sky and blue ocean and green grass, it looks quite attractive. And four years after it opened, um, it was renamed the Cross Bay Veterans Memorial Bridge. And you can see the veterans and their families celebrating the renaming. So we've taken you through the history of our seven bridges and two tunnels. If you weren't familiar with them before, you might be now. And we're going to tell you a little bit more about our special archive, um, what we do um, and what our archives contains. So we preserve and advocate for the history of MTA bridges and tunnels. We assist with research. Um, we contain 40,000 st still images, 3,600 feet of correspondence, but more every day. Uh, renderings, our original construction drawings, we have moving film images, sound recordings, scrapbooks, artifacts, and a lot more. One of the collections of photos that we have is a collection of survey photos, and these were photos taken to document the route of a bridge or a tunnel and what property might have to be acquired 
to, to uh, construct that route. And this is a photo of um, 42nd Street in 1938. So it's an interesting historical photo in itself. And it was taken to document the route um, along 42nd Street to the entrance to the Queen's Midtown Tunnel. And I love this collection because uh, it's not just the exteriors of buildings, but they actually went into businesses and people's houses. They took pictures of their dining rooms. They took pictures right. of their basements. It's really an exciting look at the inside of people's houses in the 1930s that you would not normally see. Yeah. Um, we also have these renderings. So we've looked at maps um, and talked about planning for these facilities, but part of planning for the facilities was also planning their appearance um, a little more specifically. So this is a rendering of the Brooklyn Plaza. Mary mentioned earlier that we'd see the back or front end of the BBT. Um, this is a 1941 image and you can really see the artistic point of view of the early 1940s uh, and how this massive, infrastructure piece is being presented also as a piece of art. I think it's really interesting. It's very art. It, it really does, yeah. So far we've talked about facilities, bridges or tunnels that we have constructed ourselves. Now we're going a little bit outside uh, bridges and tunnels to show you a, a, a rendering, another rendering. This is a lovely color rendering of a facility that Robert Moses himself wanted to build. He was responsible for building much of the infrastructure of New York City. He had great plans for it. And this was an expressway that he planned to run from the Holland Tunnel to the Manhattan Bridge. It was never built. There was a lot of opposition to it, but we still have this beautiful rendering in our special archive. And then the correspondence that we mentioned. Um, so on the left, you can see everything in folders. The uh, box on the left is tunnel authority records. And on the right, we just pulled a Western Union telegram to Robert Moses from a member of the New York Assembly. Um, so in 1937, he's sending a telegram saying, we've succeeded in securing money for the Ferry Point Bridge. Um, the Ferry Point Bridge became the Bronx Whitestone Bridge. Um, so it opened in April 1939, just a couple of years after this telegram was sent. Really a, a remarkable pace of construction. Another example of the type of record we have is, is a program. This is a program for the groundbreaking ceremony of the Verrazano Bridge in 1959. And uh, you can see in the photograph here, uh, in a white suit jacket, Robert Moses. So uh, Robert Moses made sure that he documented every event. He made sure of every photo opportunity. And uh, this is one of many. Yeah, and later we'll see a brochure, an example of a brochure. Uh, he really made sure to publicize his uh, big events. Um, this is a, the preservation master of a film that we have. So speaking of publicizing, uh, Moses would put out these short videos that would play at, you know, Elks Lodges or civic society meetings. Um, this film is called Roads to the Future, and it's a um, piece promoting arterial construction in the 1960s. Uh, and we're also going to play now just a little clip uh, from another film. This is the opening day of the Triborough Bridge. Uh, and you can see, so this is 1936, you can see all these cars crossing the bridge on the sides, you can see the pedestrians. And we saw earlier a still of this opening day, but it's actually grabbed from this moving image. This um, particular uh, example of our holdings is, is one that I really appreciate. It's a scrapbook. It's one of a series of scrapbooks actually that document um, from newspapers, uh, the events of working in uh, the Queens Midtown Tunnel or the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. There's a lot of coverage of how the work was continuing, uh, what the workers had to withstand, um, uh, how they uh, asked for better working conditions. And it's a real um, snapshot of uh, a day in, in the life of a, what, what were called sand hogs, the workers who actually worked in the tunnels. And Nelly, when you talked about the uh, compressed air and what the sand hogs had to go through, I read on a page here that when they emerged from the decompression chambers and the tunnels, they drank extra strong <laughs> black 
coffee to help them recover. I think it was in their union contract. Yeah, okay. uh, definitely coffee was an important part of the job. Um, we're now gonna play another film, another short video clip. This is Mary presenting one of our models. We're looking at a model of the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. The engineers would build models to lay out the route of a bridge, the components of a bridge, and they'd present these models to community groups or bankers who might be providing funding to politicians. And, and at the same time, they would show where the bridge components would grow, go. So you can see that this is a model of Brooklyn and this is a model of Staten Island. And the engineers laid out a path that would go at the narrowest part of the land points in Brooklyn and Staten Island. And uh, here are the towers of the Verrazano Bridge. Here is the Staten Island toll plaza that no longer exists. And you can see that the bridge approaches link up with other highways. So that was a big component of building a bridge to link up with other highways or expressways. And you can see here, this links up with the Kiwanis Expressway or the BQE, and over here, the Staten Island Expressway. So uh, you can see that the um, uh, suspension bridge goes across the body of water called the Narrows, the narrowest point in Brooklyn. Another thing that this model shows is that the borough of Brooklyn, and only a little bit is represented here, was completely filled up with housing and businesses. And Staten Island, as you can see, with these little plastic houses that are speckled everywhere, um, was pretty empty. It was very rural. So one of the objectives of building a bridge between Staten Island and Brooklyn was to open up Staten Island for development and to allow people to drive from Staten Island to Brooklyn and from there to Long Island. So it was very strategic. It had been in the planning phase for 30 or 40 years until uh, the Tribal Bridge and Tunnel Authority um, was able to get permission and acquisition rights on each side uh, for the bridge to be built. So we have that model in the special archive. Um, this is a model we don't still have in the special archive, but we're showing it to you just sort of as a presentation to demonstrate what that model would have been used for. So this is a bank, I believe it's in Brooklyn, um, and they have an entire display of what the Narrows Bridge Brooklyn approach will look like. On the left, you can see a rendering of the Verrazano, and on the right, you can see some of the construction photos, similar to what we've already seen. Um, so basically these models would go on tour and they would uh, be used locally so that people could understand the scope of these infrastructure projects. I just love this picture because I think it's very rare that we see examples of these models as they were actually displayed. Usually we just see them as artifacts, but in fact, you know, they were, they spoke to people. They were intended to tell a story and give a message. What do we do internally? Um, we spend a lot of time doing research for the engineers who work in our construction and development unit. We uh, undertake legal and jurisdictional research for boundary disputes, and we advocate for bridges and tunnels history. And I think what's really interesting about our jobs and what we do is that we are primarily an internal archive. Yes. Um, so many archives collect and they are open to the public for research. We really are intended to support MTA bridges and tunnels internally specifically. And I think it makes our roles really, really unique. Yeah. Um, so if you've driven over the Robert F. Kennedy Bridge recently, this might look familiar. Uh, about five years ago, we went to cashless tolling, open road tolling. So we no longer have toll plazas at our facilities. We no longer have toll booths. Instead, what we have are these gantries. And so when we were designing the gantries, um, you know, putting in the toll infrastructure, modernizing our structures and how they operate, we thought about what we wanted to look like and how we wanted those to operate. And you can see stretching across the photo is the gantry and those are supported by these light posts, which um, also hold some additional infrastructure, but they aren't just attractive. They also reference these structures. Um, 
so these light posts were actually part of the original 1936 bridge. Um, you can see the entirety of the original toll plaza here. And so when we were thinking about modernizing what we wanted to be moving forward, we also thought about where we'd come from. And so we did a lot of research on what the plaza originally looked like, what the infrastructure originally consisted of. Um, these were removed in the 1960s, but this is what we referenced moving forward. Um, and you can see, again, a wider shot here, um, putting them in a little bit more perspective uh, and the entirety of the bridge on Randalls Island. We also do research for the State Historic Preservation Office. Uh, so this is the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel Vent Building um, in Manhattan. And you can see it says Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. Um, many of our facilities are landmark eligible. And so we have a responsibility uh, to preserve them historically for the people of New York. Uh, and so a few years ago, the engineers came to us and said, we wanna gild the lettering on the vent building. What would that look like? What can we tell the State Historic Preservation Office about its original appearance to support that decision? So Mary and I undertook some research. Uh, this is 1950, right when the tunnel opened and you can see actually there is no lettering. Uh, so what, what happened? Um, it turns out it's very difficult to tell from black and white photos whether lettering was gilded, but we gave it the old college try. Um, this is the same building in 1979. You can tell by 1979 there was writing, but it doesn't quite look like it has any kind of color to it. So we went through those paper records that we saw um, and pulled out an original purchase order from 1950 saying, yes, we're gonna take bids. Uh, we are gonna incise letters. So this is just a couple months after the tunnel opened. Uh, but by 1954, the paint was starting to peel. And based on these um, records and the difficulties we had with the paint originally, we decided we were gonna skip the paint entirely. This is an example of the many maps that we have in the archives. Uh, this is a very rudimentary one, but it's still important because it lays out who was responsible for what. In this case, uh, the Bronx Whitestone Bridge uh, passes through two parks, one in the Bronx and one in Queens. And it was important to document whether the Parks Department was, was responsible for their piece and who was responsible for the Tribal Bridge Authority piece. Um, so the red is coded for maintenance by the Tribal Bridge Authority and the green by the Parks Department. And even though that is a very old document, um, it still represents the original understanding between the two entities. This represents another little detective trip into the archives. So this is a construction shed for the Throgs Neck Bridge in the Bronx. A few years ago, um, the Department of Citywide Administrative Services came to us and said, we own this piece of land and there is a property on it. And the people who occupy the pro property say they bought it from the Tribal Bridge and Tunnel Authority many decades ago. So lo and behold, um, we looked through our records and we looked in our minutes to see if the authority mentioned anything like that in the minutes. And we had digitized our minutes a few years ago. So we were able to search them. And we found that the Locust Point Civic Association um, bought the property, not the land, bought the property from us in 1961 and on the right, you can see the bill of sale. So we told DCAS that yes, they had a legitimate right to that building and um, um, our records were able to prove it. And then we also do a lot of research um, for internal programming and writing. Um, these 12 women that you can see on your screen and also right behind me, um, our 12 employees we're very proud of. We are very proud of all of our staff, um, but they were tunnel authority employees in the 1940s. So during World War II, uh, many of our tunnel officers were drafted or called away to war. And these 12 women stepped into roles traditionally held by men as many women across the country did. Um, many of them were actually the wives of drafted tunnel authority employees. Um, and so we were able to dig through the records and we were able to find their names, their pay scales, benefits information, civic programming they'd participated in, uh, their revolver qualifications. 
Um, and then they also uh, were featured in those scrapbooks. So on the right, you can see a woman named Juliet Jones. And on the left, you can see a similar photo of a woman named Lorraine Murray. Um, these women served for several years, but then at the end of the war, they all went home, uh, they were laid off and women didn't serve in a similar role until 1977. What we do externally, we support museums, academics, uh, book publishers, film companies, and other agencies like the Parks Department or the Port Authority. So this image was graciously loaned to us by our friends at the Transit Museum. Um, this is uh, an exhibit that we partnered with the Transit Museum, ooh, excuse me, Museum on to celebrate the Triborough Bridge's 70th anniversary. Uh, so in the foreground, you can see we have a model of the Triborough Bridge. In the background, you can see some photos from our collection. On the right, you can see one of the bonds that we sold uh, to finance construction of the bridge. Uh, and we uh, loan these materials out to museums in the region and across the country. This is the front cover of a brochure from 1959, and it is our most requested image, actually. And it shows uh, some of Robert Moses' plans to build expressways in lower Manhattan and across Manhattan and uh, in mid Manhattan. This particular one shows the uh, plan to build a, an expressway from, as I mentioned earlier, the Hol Holland Tunnel to the Williamsburg Bridge. And you can see that there is a side line to the Manhattan Bridge. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, this was never built. But there are um, uh, students and uh, uh, authors who are very interested in structures that were never built. And this is uh, one of the images they love to use. I think 50 or 60% of our licensing requests are this image. Yeah. We have all these beautiful, beautiful pictures and no, yes. cross Manhattan arterials, what everyone wants. Um, a few years ago, just as another example of external support, we were contacted by the costume designer for the film Motherless Brooklyn. And apparently there's a scene where they drive across the Triborough Bridge, it's 1950. And he said, hey, what would tunnel officers or bridge and tunnel officers wear in 1950? And what would the plazas look like? So we sent them several reference images, including these uh, bridge and tunnel officers at the opening of the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. And also this image, which I love, uh, showing the plaza of the Triborough Bridge um, as it would have looked and as people would have worked uh, roughly around the same time. Nelly. Yes. Coincidentally, four nights ago, I watched Motherless Brooklyn. Did it have amazing costume design? The guy stepped out for one second <laughs> as a car whizzed by. You couldn't even see his costume. I'm, I'm going to assume they cut that. <clears throat> um, one thing that Nellie and I do and many archivists do is try to document the present so that we don't lose it. So uh, this is an example of collecting records documented documenting COVID-19. So we collected all the official records, um, internal communications, photographs, uh, or, uh, we conducted an oral history with people. And this is uh, one of our maintenance workers working with a mask um, as, as a uh, frontline worker. Um, so uh, we're very concerned about documenting the present so that the archivists who come after us will have access to information. And it might not even be the archivists that come after us. Um, I got a phone call yesterday from somebody looking for press releases from open road tolling. That project was five years ago, Yeah, uh, but we've migrated our website. So nothing earlier than 2020 is on the website. So we have them all, we've pulled them. Um, we have them for future us, but turns yeah. out today us needed them. Yeah. Um, which brings us to our final point, which is you can't just sort of leave these things and hope that they'll be there. Um, this is a model of the Midtown Manhattan Expressway, uh, and you can see it was stored under the Triborough Bridge, so it is not in presentable shape. Um, benign neglect doesn't really get you a preservation quality standard. Um, similarly, these negatives, uh, they're made of acetate and they've been affected with something called vinegar syndrome. So acetic acid um, is something that acetate will start to throw off. And once that happens, uh, 
they smell like vinegar and they almost look like they've been put in a microwave. They get brittle um, and it's contagious. So once it starts, it will spread to any other negatives in the box. And obviously you're not gonna pull a nice print off of these. So Mary and I are here because the structures in some cases are almost 90 years old. They're gonna stand for another 90 years. So Mary and I might not be doing this job in 90 years, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> hoping I won't either, um, but somebody will. Uh, somebody will need to be taking care of these things in the future. And I can only imagine that they'll become more necessary as our structures age. So. Thank you very much, Amy. Thank you to the Transit Museum for hosting us. That was wonderful. I'm so I think you're going to show so many things from your archives, but the stories behind them were just, especially when it comes to your own work and helping with costume design, I would never would have guessed that that would cross <laughs> the desk. Uh, we, we'd have a bunch of photo, a uh, bunch of questions coming in through the chat. Just a reminder, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and I'll share them out. And I've been recording some of the questions that we've gotten so far. So first of all, my question, what's the favorite thing for each of you you have in your archive? If, if that's, that might not be um, a fair question. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's a, that's a good question because um, archivists usually have a favorite item. And mine is a diary that was kept by the uh, chief operating officer for the New York City Tunnel Authority in uh, between 1936 and 1940 in which he writes everything he did every day and the time of it. So uh, that included meetings with Mayor LaGuardia, meetings with foreign dignitaries, um, as well as dealing with um, uh, sand hog issues. So I, I love that set of diaries. You, you can immerse yourself in them and take yourself back. Um, and I think mine is actually photos of tunnel construction. <laughs> so, uh, we have these beautiful photos of the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel in the uh, late 1940s, 1948, 1949, and they were doing cut and cover tunnel construction. So unlike what we saw, you basically just dug a big trench and then built on top of it, but they went right through Battery Park and we have these aerial photos and you can see all of Manhattan, the entire skyline, and then just this big trench of construction underneath. I just think they're very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, great. We have uh, a couple questions that had to do with the, the makeup and diversity of recruitment for bridge and tunnel staff members and toll workers. Was there ever any policy or initiative to uh, like either segregate or desegregate or create policies or opportunities for diverse range of workers that you guys know of or that stick out? Mm. Not really. We know ourselves that we are part of a diverse workforce um, and that diversity was something that the MTA uh, introduced and stressed many decades ago. Yeah, and the tunnel officers specifically are civil service titles. So those were filled in accordance with civil service laws. Um, I will say it's interesting. I said 1977 was when those um, women were rehired into those roles. You can see in the correspondence, um, they know that they're coming up the list. So you take a test, you get put on a list, and then you hire from the top of the list and people move up the list. And so there's correspondence discussing um, female locker rooms because mm -hmm. they know that they're going to have to build them. They know that they are hiring women soon. Um, it wasn't necessarily a push, mm -hmm. but it is a, a thing that they could see coming um, just through civil service. Yeah. Okay, great. I think we have a lot of researchers in the audience. So there's been a lot of questions <laughs> on what resources might be available. Probably, um, so how much, so just to start the most general question, how much of the collection is digitized and there are there any ongoing efforts to digitize more of it? And I'll add on to it, you know, have it more widely accessible. Um, over the years, um, we've digitized a lot of our construction photos um, because they are very interesting and they document the actual activities that went on. Um, there, we have about 40,000 photographs um, and most of those are for the construction of our seven bridges and two tunnels. Um, and we, uh, 
I don't know what percentage are digitized, but it is a considerable one. Um, other records that are easy to digitize because you don't have to do them one at a time, you can feed them through a scanner would be the minutes or um, uh, older correspondence files, not fragile ones, but you know, from the 1980s or 90s. Um, what else? Do Press we releases. Press releases are easy to digitize. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll speak to the digit digitization policy, which yeah. uh, is generally discrete, so it has a beginning and an end. Um, generally either extremely fragile and we're afraid we'll lose it or extremely sturdy and we know that we can uh, put it aside and then in high use for us as internal researchers those are the preservation criteria or the digitization criteria we consider yeah okay great and then also in terms of uh, there's two topics that were asked if the hard to find and libraries are online, the joint study, uh, joint study of arterial facilities that was worked on in the 1950s. The, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's seminal, so I don't know what it is, but um, does the MTA have any plans to make that available or more, more available to the public? I think that those arterial studies can be found in the New York Public Library and other institutions. Um, the Museum of the City of New York may have copies. Um, people can certainly make an appointment with us to come and view our copies. Yeah, or just WorldCat would have a, a list of yeah. local, local special libraries where that would be available. Great. And someone asked, do you have any of Robert Moses's papers or are they all at NYPL? We have um, all Robert Moses files that document the planning and construction of our seven bridges and tunnels. So that's core to the mission of our agency and our special archive. But in addition, we have hundreds of thousands of documents for the planning and construction of just about every highway, expressway, and parkway in New York City, um, as well as the World's Fair. Um, the World's Fair event in 1964 and 1965, for which Robert Moses was the chairman. We have a significant collection of records for that. Yeah. Do you have any recommendations about for books about New York City bridges and tunnels? Ooh. I don't even think there is a book about us. Oh, there's The Bridge by Gay Talisi, uh, which is about the Verrazano. That's a great book and we have licensed photos for it. So yeah. if you get a copy with photos, they're probably ours. Oh, okay, great. It's called The Bridge. The Bridge, yeah. yeah. I like that. <laughs> uh, so do you have any material on the original proposal to connect Staten Island Rapid Transit to the rest of the subway system via the Verrazano? Um, I'm not aware of anything as specific as that. We certainly have a few records um, about plans for transportation in Staten Island, um, but I think you, Amy, might have more records than we do since the Staten Island Railroad would come under your purview. Yeah, perhaps um, I'm not well, oh, uh, if someone from the New York Transit Museum might have an idea, we have that in our archives and can put that in the chat, that would be great. I don't know off the top of my head, but we do have a lot of our uh, photos and images digitized on our website. So it might be worth doing a quick search for the person that asked that question. Um, so one thing that obviously in the the history, th there's a lot of controversy around some of these projects. Is there part of the archive that captures those types of stories or evidence? There's been a bunch of questions that kind of circle around uh, that issue. Yeah, yeah. Um, any con correspondence that was received um, for a pro or con, any uh, of our facilities, we, we have all of them. Okay. So I'm guessing, yeah, yeah. we have a lot, a lot we to walk through. Yeah. Uh, one thing, kind of an interesting comment, less of a question, was about the models. Someone said that 
by providing such a bird's eye view, they didn't really show the pedestrian scale view or impact. So it's interesting that the models actually did a great job at selling the projects, but they might actually have made them appear less impactful than they actually were, could have been. I don't know if you have any response to that. Uh, two, two points. Number one, we do have some models that are um, closer view. So we didn't see those on the presentation, um, but the models that we saw, the two or three models that we saw aren't representative of 100% of the facilities. Um, I think in some cases that was by design. Uh, and I also think that in some cases, if you're showing a facility connecting to an arterial network, you kind of mm -hmm. have to pick, right? So you can show a giant highway system or you can show a much smaller scale. And so certainly both types of models got made. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can't, I don't think you can really do both, so. Right, I mean, a closer, yeah. closer look or a zoomed in look wouldn't necessarily show you a broader impact on the, on, on the mapping of an area yeah. either. Right. Right? There's pros and cons, I think, with either type of model. Uh, yeah, and I think in some cases, that's why they made both, right? Mm -hmm. So the um, Verrazano model that Mary showed was much, much more bird's eye view than that model that we saw in the bank in Brooklyn, which was a similar model of a, but at a smaller scale. Got it. So we do, this is a, a train loving audience. So we did have another question related to uh, trains, but do you, do your archives have any discussion of placing trains on the bridges and tunnels themselves? Not really. There were never plans to do that with any other. I think perhaps the city's plan for the Triborough Bridge may have included um, a plan for public transportation, but uh, when the Triborough Bridge Authority um, picked it up, that plan, if there was one, was, was um, dissolved. Yeah, I will say we do have a decent amount of bus correspondence, though. So. Yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great point. We represent buses too, the New York yep. Transit Museum. Well, someone just asked bus contents how? Can you maybe elaborate? Oh, tolling structures, franchise bus schedules. Um, on our bridges. On our bridges. Yeah. Some kind of very complicated argument about a bus parking depot uh, in the 50s. Uh, it's kind of sprinkled in there. Yeah. Yeah. It's not our, our area of expertise. No. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, I think, I think that's it for the time we have for questions. I want to thank you both so much. That was really interesting and such a different related, but different take to, I think what we usually talk about with the subway system and transit in New York. And I want to thank you all for joining us and coming today. We'd love to see you at the museum if you're in town. I'm going to put the link to visit into the chat as well as a link to become a member or to donate. Uh, by becoming a member or donating to the museum, you help keep our wonderful programs like these going. And we hope you join us for more upcoming virtual events. Peter Lloyd is returning to talk about the New York City subway map maker, Andrew Hackstrom, May 11th at 6 p.m. That's our next virtual talk. And we'd also like to thank our sponsor, Con Ed, for supporting our virtual programs. So thank you again, and I hope everyone has a great evening. Thank you, Amy. Thank, thank you, guys. For all, thank you all for joining us. Good yeah. night.